A good day to all who tuned into Daybreak News with the Guyanese Critic. Today I have with me the Minister uh, within the Ministry of Public Works, Mr. Diodat Indar, and we will be discussing, as you will see in my header, um, the Ministry of Public Works have some $39.6 billion um, allocated out of the budget uh, for them to spend on the people's work that would be infrastructure and um, a lot of other things that are entailed under the Ministry of Public Works. Uh, Minister Indar, thank you for having me. And, um, I want to get right to me into it. You have, uh, your ministry has $39.6 billion to spend and that deals with the development of infrastructure in Guyana for the most part and Guyanese should really see benefits throughout this year as a result of what this ministry would be rolling out. Can you tell the citizens what to expect? Well, thank you very much for making the time to come back. Um, and again, thank you. So, let me just get right into it. So, we have $39.6 billion, which represents about 10.8% of the total budget. The budget is $383.1 billion. Um, but let's strip that down a bit. Let's go into the, you know, the capital element and the current element. So the budget is split between current expenditure, which is about $6 billion for the ministry to deal with his employment and other charges for running the ministry, the maintenance budget and so on. Um, so that's $6 billion due to the current recurrent expenditure. The balance of that, which is $32.9 billion, is for capital works. And I'll go through what that was be spent on. So the capital works budget for the entire country is $103 billion for all of the ministries, for, for all of the budget agencies, $103 billion. We have $32.9 billion of that $103 billion. So we have about 32.8% of the total capital spend of the country. So let's see where that money is going. So we have in the budget $23.7 billion for roads alone. So you're talking roads upon roads upon roads. So there's the East Coast Road that was recently completed. There's the West Coast Road that seems to be holding up. The East Bank, that is there. We're talking in addition to these roads. Yes. People could expect, because I've seen roads in, in, in some areas, back down. I don't know where the roads are going. But they're going somewhere. I see roads. I was wondering, you know, where these roads are going. So there's outside of what we have existing here. People can expect more. more. So, so let me just tell you a, a couple of the main items on that. So, out of the twenty-three point seven billion dollars, we have um, hinterland roads. In the hinterland alone, about two billion one hundred and fifty million for that to deal with roads in regions nine, eight, seven, regions one, parts of region two inland. Um, we also have roads for uh, Region 10 in the hinterland, going into the hinterland um, to grade and shape these roads and so on, right? And push new roads too. So that 2.1 billion will deal with hinterland roads. Then we have the hinterland air strips, a number of air strips that we're rehabilitating. I think you just saw we did a let them air drill, right? We have the ring bang, we have a couple more air strips that we are refurbishing. So we also have the stellings. I'll come to the roads last. I'll just give you the figure. I'll tell you what we're doing with roads. Let me deal with the smaller items. We have the stellings. We will be doing about four stellings uh, per week. We got a couple more of them. Uh, we will be doing back four pilot. I went to that area in Christmas time and the stelling is dilapidated. It's been abandoned. We have to do back that stelling. The money's in the budget for that. Um, apart from the stellings, we have um, the bridges. We have about $185 million for bridges. Um, so we, are, we have selected a couple of bridges when we, uh, when we were walking the ground and based on the information we got back from people, a lot of bridges need uh, repairs. Um, we have some money inside, we're going to do back a couple of them. We have one at Guam Belt we're going to do back. Cemetery Road have about two bridges we got to do back. And then there's a place called Little Baibun, Big Baibun in Mahaika to the back where the farmers cultivate about 1,200 to 1,300 acres of rice. They gotta move it 
um, the bridge is actually tilted, it's going to collapse. You can't move machinery or things on the bridge. So we have to do back that bridge. And they have another, another set of money for smaller bridges. But then we have a lot of public infrastructure. But you know, things that we do with if we're building parking lots, if we're doing access ways, if we're doing parks, small parks, if we're doing lights on the streets and so public infrastructure, there's some sums in there for that as well. So we're gonna do we're doing the parking lot the diamond. There's some monies in the budget to do a, a, a bypass to bring out diamond uh, residents onto another part of the road on the east bank. Um, there's some money there. Um, because we know the traffic issue up here um, so you have monies to deal with the public side of it, uh, public infrastructure we call it public infrastructure we have some monies in the budget also to deal with the rehabilitation of the stelling and bridge loop as well as the one over in georgetown area uh, to bring it up to a to little better condition but let me go back to the transformational ones uh, we have $7.9 billion just to deal with miscellaneous road. What we call miscellaneous road is a community's road we just described. When they're about there, as you call it, or, you know. But that is the kitchen table is you could put it. When a man comes out of his house or goes into his house, the road that he access to and from should be well. And when we walk the country, we take pictures of it. The infrastructure is roads and so on in the communities are badly needed. So that is what that money, last year we had our youth song, and we started a program last year on the emergency budget, this year it's, it's going big. Because everywhere you're going to schemes, they are, they are, they are. For selling new scheme, a lot of people have made investment in those areas, build nice houses and the roads are in a mess, quality. Yeah, so they could expect they, very yeah, soon. Yeah, but actually last year I sent some guys in there to do some great in the shaping, in the meanwhile we're gonna go in to do some roads, right? But every housing scheme have monies uh, allocated to them for roads through housing ministry. We are complementing them to it, right? But the housing schemes, then they, you know, the roads are really, really terrible. Uh, about a month and a half ago, I was in a zero tier. The road is, the, the road, the main road in there is worse than the road if you drive from Linden to Mokoa. I, I can tell that it's like, you're going like this all the time. And uh, because of that, when the rain falls, no taxi wants to go. And because the taxis don't want to go in there in the nights when people leave and people go home, they get robbed and so on. And that is pervasive across these places. If you go to Parfit Harmony, you go to Tushin, you go to Zilla, you go to Diamond, you go to all of these housing schemes, you find the same commonality of bad roads and some level of uh, drainage. So we are, we are looking, though that money is to deal with all of these things. And those housing schemes... Across this country, because some people have complained to me from Line Path, uh, Skeldon, all of, I'm going, I'm, uh, I'm number 57, 58 village. I'm going to go into the details of those. Uh, so region 6, region 5, region 4, region 3, and region 2, which is on the coastline. A lot of roads are going to be done there, uh, asphaltic up before, to reshape some of those communities. And that is within the 7.9 billion that we're talking about. We're going to put in a uh, number of roads in region 6, region 5, region 4, alone. I have about 33 roads for region 4 alone. And then you have region three have about 17 roads, region two have a number of roads as well. So we have these roads that are going into the community area. And then we have the housing scheme. Now the other night I had to answer a question if we are already building things in PVP support area. And I answered it this way quickly. Those housing schemes is a mixture of what Guyana is. It's different colors in those housing schemes. So when you build road in the housing scheme, it's for every man, every child, every woman, of all different races that live in. So for a person to accuse us of that, I think it's it's misplaced and it's hard wash. Because we build roads in every area. Right now we have a lot of roads uh, building out in, in Linden. Linden don't vote much for us, we, but we have supporters there. But as government, we don't look at who vote for us and who didn't vote for us. Everybody are taxpayers, they're citizens of the country. And they have the equal right to that government service. Whether it's electricity, water, roads, and infrastructure, it's equal right that everybody has, and you have to provide that equal right. So we're building it out in all of the different communities across the country. So that 7.9 is what we call it miscellaneous roads. So let's move into the other areas of the transformative ones that we have. So we have, the, we have um, the bypass road that's going to the four lane. So that is 7.9 kilometers of road, four lanes of, of a bypass road. Um, that's going to start sometime this year. 
right? I would say around August, September time period because no one should procurement fees. And the procurement fees, because it's financed by the government, the, the, the procurement fees is a little, um, you know, more stringent in terms of all the checks and balances that these international banks have to put in to get it to the finality. So you have to go through that. There's no escaping that. You have to do it to make sure that it's transparent and clean. And when that, whoever that is awarded to, you will see works by, by the uh, end of this year. We have the Demarara Harbor Bridge, which is a massive project. Right? We, uh, we are in, we are in you know, short list of nine companies, and we're going ahead with the second round of it. And that is when you're going to see that contract come to uh, fruition sometime around October. Right? In terms of award. Again, that is a big contract. It's a big project. We have never done something that large yet in terms of infrastructure in the country. So you have to make sure you cross all the T's and that RBIs. The that. biggest project yet uh, Guyana has ever seen. In terms of infrastructure. Infrastructure. Right? Um, then you have the Borbies Bridge between, the, sorry, the quarantine bridges connecting Guyana to Suriname. That we got not take expressions of interest for that. Um, the other transformative project is the Schoonard Road, the road from Schoonard to Perica, to open up all of the lands there and so on, and open up roads and highways and housing schemes. You have a whole host of things you can do for the lands that are adjacent to the roads. Um, we walk the alignment with the president. Everybody's uh, we, there are sums in the budget to be able to studies now and the alignment and so on, and that is going to help us. There's also sums in the budget to deal with the road, the alignment of the study and so on, and some level of construction from Goshen to Monkey Jump by Bartico. And there is also monies in this budget to deal with studies and alignment and so on, to deal with the road from Monkey Jump through Macabro, Sand Hills to Tinio. So you're connecting the road network. And all of that is in the budget. All are going out to procurement so that we can start those works. So you have a whole host of capital works here um, that is in the procurement stage now, and uh, once the procurement is finished and they are awarded, you'll see mobilization. Has the ministry taken into consideration um, the kind of massive job creation? Can we fill that? Will we be looking for foreign contractors, or will we be able to create jobs for Guyanese as a result of these massive infrastructure projects? So, so it depends on which one you're talking about. For example, like the roads and the bridges, the small bridges, the roads, community bridges, roads, and so on. And so on. Guyanese capacity can deal with it. You need more capacity in Guyana too, because remember, there's more money is going through the same procurement system, um, the same mobilization, advance, and second and third payment and final payment. So that process of procurement and payment tends to slow down uh, the implementation of, of the public um, investment program, which is this capital program. So, if you have more contractors coming in board, uh, coming on board, it will at least the work will be spread it out more. It will be done faster than if you give one man ten jobs and he can't finish them. Right? You're using one set of machine to do this job and then you can move it to the next one and the next one. So that will slow up the implementation and cause problems. We don't want that. We want people to come in. Now, Guyana have a lot of contractors that have been, I will tell you, flat out that have, for the past five years on the DAP and they didn't see a job. When I came into this office here, in that corner is normally be sitting by that table here. The among the people that came and said they have not gotten a contract, their business is bankrupt. Banks are closing, are foreclosing on their, their businesses because they didn't have any income. Right? All of those people are out there, have machines parked up. Those people are now coming back into the fold. New ones are coming back into the fold. You have the existing contractors, and then you have the foreign ones coming up. A lot of foreign contractors now are in the country, partnering with people with Guyanese to make sure that they work together um, and uh, to bring you know more um, skills into the country. Broader engineering skills, more in-depth skills, and they have the track record of building up bigger projects. For example, the, the, the Harbor Bridge and those things, that, those are massive projects. And I don't think there are any Guyanese, because we're in Guyana, we never built something like, like that. And by extension, no contract in Guyana has that kind of background. So, they will obviously, if they bid for that, you know, um, they will have to have, you know, a, a partner that has the track record and the experience of doing such a thing. So, with respect to the job creation that you talk about, this is inevitable 
in terms of the amount of contracts and the amount of works that's going to be in the pipeline. And remember, our government is not just this ministry. They have local government doing construction works, they have housing, and they have building works being done by the Ministry of uh, Education for the schools and so on. Then you have um, rehabilitation and so on, building of things from the health. So you have all of these different ministries have their own capital programs. So it's a massive amount of, uh, of works will be in the system, simply because of the size of the spending. And uh, we're going to see a significant amount of changes in the country. And that is what we want to do. Minister, you have, um, on the new government of your administration taking up their position, you and uh, Minister Edgel, there have been a number of instances of corruption in these ministries that have been uncovered, or corruption with ministry officials and contractors and so on. Um, a number of jobs that uh, weren't going as they should have gone. What is the ministry doing to ensure this? there's no continuum in that level of, of corruption in, within the ministries? Well, if you look at corruption and if you study fraud, you know, I, I'm a certified internal lawyer. So back in the day, I used to lecture to the public on fraud and how to deter it and you know, how it, how it, how it, what environment festers well for fraud to take place. And there's two things you must do. The first one is that the control environment and the control systems. So the control systems in all of these ministries are relatively strong. They have a lot of procedures, ducts, stacks of, of, of procedures and what should, should, should be done and what should not be done. There's a procurement law of 2003 that tells you specifically how our, our procurement is supposed to be done. Their evaluation criteria is everybody, need to, uh, everybody knows what they have to evaluate and how it's to award and so on. In those, there might be cracks and opportunities for fraud to take place. But what we have done when we came in as a government, we dealt firstly with the control environment. The control environment is what the man at the top says about fraud, and what he says about corruption. If he's going to be lenient, and he's not going to be lenient, if he's going to turn a blind eye, or, you know, but we've been clear in the control environment that we are not going to allow for these kind of things. We're not going to allow shabby work. We're not going to allow um, contractors and employees to collude. We're not going to allow employees to give us false reports about what's done. We're not going to allow overpayment. So those are the things we have made clear that we are not allowing. So we made the control environment clear as day that we are not allowing these things. And as you can see, we have moved out some people. We have asked, is this missed some people. We have cut some contracts short. We have canceled some contracts. And that is sending the message that we are not allowing that. So we set the control environment clear as day that we're not allowing this kind of corruption or fraud. Move a couple levels downward now um, to deal with the system, the control systems now, which deals with um, uh, engineering estimates and uh, you know the, the confidentiality of those when bidding is happening and those kind of things so that potential bidders don't know what the engineering estimates are so that they can be close to it or below it and so on. So. Those are certain things that uh, have to be tightened up. Um, the evaluation and the evaluators who are evaluating this contract and used to be some in this ministry, they're no longer here. They are the MBTA, the National Procurement and Technology Administration Board, they evaluate. Right? So that has been moved up. Um, a number of other changes have been made. So you're right, um, fraud was taking place and corruption was. Uh, uh, we have exposed a lot of them. I recently, we recently spoke of the number of them that we had at this ministry and that the agencies under this ministry like the Marara Harbor Bridge and Asphalt Plant and Marad and you know GCEA where they had all of this, you know, this gift buying thing and so on. So we made it clear to everybody and we are making sure that we put systems and different people at strategic points to make sure that decision making is, um, is checked by other people. It's not, you know, one person alone is doing something and it, you know, it's a, it's a king in a kingdom kind of thing. It don't work that way. There's checks and balances to make sure, you know, decisions are, are reviewed by others. To make sure that they don't have this kind of, you know, runaway train kind of thing. One of the things that uh, is a growing concern, 
as a result of the opposition's uh, putting out this information in the media, some persons in the opposition suggest that this administration and ministries are going after people based on their ethnicity. Can you speak to that? Well, I... Or firing people based on their ethnicity. I don't think there's any fact, is there any fact in that. If you've done wrong, regardless of what your colleague is, you've done wrong. If you've broken a law, regardless of what the colleague is, you've broken a law. It's not, it's not the, 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 the person, it's the process that you've destroyed. It's the, it's the laws that you've destroyed. It's the taxpayers' funds that you've squandered. That is the issue. They're making the issue of the duo. The duo is one aspect of the problem. It is the laws that you broke. It is the monies that you can't account for. How come for? So did Amarara have a bitch thing with the gentleman? Is that a wrong thing or is that a right thing? Is the thing you're talking about? Marad with the with, with the, all of the money spent, six hundred and fifty seven million dollars without a single um, mobilization or works completed and six hundred and fifty seven million was paid out. Is the thing that you have done. Is that a doer? The doer is a, that is a consequence of the thing that was done, the mischief that was done. And that is what, you know, people try to say, oh, they make it a political thing and they say, oh, you know, our, our, our Af Afro-Guinese uh, are being targeted. Uh, it's misplaced. It's just enthusiastic corruption of the public good. That is not the case. If they can say that I did not do this, well, fine. Or if they have given the chance to say, tell me what has happened here, can you give an answer? And they have not given a proper answer, or they have given a proper answer for it. You think they would have been dismissed? How much persons you have working in these ministries and government agencies are Afro guys? They still have the job. They still have the job. You know why? They didn't. A lot of them didn't go in uh, and do scholarly. So they re they maintain the job and they carry on in life because they are professionals and they are honest people and they carry on the job. Then. So the multitudes of civil servants can rest assured that providing they're professional and they do their job in service to Guyanese people, their job is secure. Their job is secure. They, and, and all over government, you have to be blind not to see it. It is all walks of life in these government agencies. The ones that do mischief, you have to pay for whatever mischief you've done. You have to answer for that. For them to politicize that is a different story. Minister, um, I know you got a busy day closing up. I would like to, in all of my interviews, I have a question called the pack a punch. <laughs> and most of the time, it is personal. Um, recently, opposition MPs and opposition affiliates took a photograph of your home, some house you're building somewhere, and suggested that you just come in and you already get a big house. Can you speak to that? Okay. <laughs> You know, so that is, is, is funny. Because, you know, when I was out of politics, um, I used to see it happening a lot, you know? And it was never something that I consumed very as a, as a Guyanese citizen. But now it's happening to me. Um, two things. The first time is that I saw it was sent to me because I don't follow, I don't follow certain people on my social media. So I don't see when they put up stuff. So somebody sent something to me that, uh, Sheriff Duncan put up over my house with the undertone that I just became a minister in a bill of a house. Right? So I just want to say to you and the hundreds of thousands of people that follow you is that that house was started to build since January of 2021, long before the elections. When I became a minister on the 5th of August, about a month after, the media went and took pictures of that house and they ran a story on it. And they put the house up when it was over 60% company. Right? Um, the house continued to be built because they can't leave it unfinished. If they, the undertone is that, you know, something, you know, uh, dishonest is happening there, the answer is, hell no. Not just a no. Hell no. I have a serious issues with uh, people trying to smear people who work hard. I also see Mark Benchka, a whole used washed up politician, put my house up on his page. Must he get about 10 likes or 20 likes or something like that? Um, trying to put my, you know, my house, it does two things with it. One, is that my wife and my two little daughters live in that house. They've exposed me in terms of security. And I intend to deal with that part and another time. 
the other part of it, which they try, they're trying to say, you know, these EPP guys, you know, they're just coming and like if you know something sinister happened, that is not the case. You know, he said, uh, he must be saved up since he was in preppy. Well, I, let me tell you what I was doing in preppy. I was going to school with a rubber slip on my foot, right? I was going to school when the rubber slip was done, I went bare feet. When they didn't have food, when I came home, I eat a green mango, drink some water, went back to school. I'm not ashamed of those things. I wear them as a badge of honor. You know what I did, my brother? I went and I studied. I studied more than anybody else's study. I studied night and day. When them in the house dribbling, sleeping, I'm up three in the morning till five the sunrise, and I'm studying for years. From the age of 21 till I became 29, I was studying. And I qualified myself, I worked hard, I saved, and I built. I built and I continue to build. I will not let no politician, no one, stop me from building. And that is the message to every single other guy. If you're in a village, boy or girl, if you're in any village, anywhere, and people tell you that you can become a minister of government, I am proof that you can come from the lowest level and become something in this country. And I will not allow any politician, anywhere, to tell me that I can't build a house, put my family in, of whatever size I want to do. Once the money is honest, once you work hard for it, you go ahead and do it. I will do it. Minister Indar, um, since you're on that, you have played a number of roles in the private sector. Yeah. Uh, what happens, I don't think that you were elevated at this level through the media while you were doing holding those positions. Just give us a little background of what you did before you became minister. So, I started working at Diana Beverages at the age of 18. I worked there for three years, and uh, about 21, when I was 21, I left the company. Well, I was a young guy, I left at 21 years old. I was the operations manager for the Borbies branch. So at 21 years, I'm operation manager, I had 15 people under my watch. And then I came to forestry, because I was studying. So I was working and studying, it was difficult for me to leave Borbies, come to Georgetown, study in the night, then go home to Brigham, then leave in the morning, go back to Borbies, it was hard, it was killing me. As a young person, I was on the road all the time, studying and working all the time. So I left the job, and I came close to town where the, the classes are. And I was studying the certified accounting technician at the time. So I started with, with Diana Forestry Commission. So in 2002 to 2004, two years, I was working here, and I started studying ACC, which is the Association of Chartered Accountants. And I finished the program two years. And then I went to Sterling. I left the job at, at, at Forestry, and I went to Sterling where I became their chief financial officer and company secretary. And I stayed there from 2004 till January of 2021, I resigned. So I worked there 16, 17 years at a senior level. Working there as a, in a big manufacturing company, is over 150 staff, big company. I became recognized in the private sector in terms of the association. And in 2017, I became the president of the George and Chamber of Commerce and Industry, which I fought as the president for local content parking meters, you know, the whole host of economic issues, taxation, you name it, the Chamber of Commerce under my leadership from 2017 to 2019, we fought for the benefits of the private sector. But while it's been there, I became the Vice Chairman of the Private Sector Commission, and I was dealing with broad issues in the private sector, not just commerce issues, manufacturing, shipping, aviation, all of the aspects of the Private Sector Commission, but deal with all of the different sectors in the country. I was dealing with all of those things with the help of my colleagues in the private sector commission. So I built up a massive, uh, uh, what we call, uh, relationship with the private sector, locally and uh, externally. Regionally, people from North America and so on. So my business contact as a businessman there became wide. And well, obviously at that time, I was in business, um, I was doing some business, there were two businesses I had, and I was running them. And, well, obviously when I came into government, I had to let go of those things, I had to liquidate, and I had to resign, and so on. So I'm no longer in the business sector, I'm a public man, I'm sort of So my background came from very humble beginnings, straight up. Um, you know, and uh, there's no, my thing is that, you know, work hard. Work hard, stay honest, and pray. That is what I do, three things. Work hard, stay honest and pray. Minister, we close on that note. I hope we can do this again some other time. And I'm hoping that you um, 
can use the abilities that you've acquired over the years by studying and having on-hand experience with companies like Sterling and so on, and you could deploy that in this ministry and better serve Guyanese people. I want to thank you once again. I want to thank you.